The Fall of the House of Usher During a whole autumn day, dark, gloomy, silent, in which the clouds hung heavy and oppressive in the skies, I had crossed alone, on horseback, across a singularly monotonous expanse of countryside, and at last I found myself, when the shadows of the night stretched out, in sight of the melancholy house of Usher. I do not know how it happened, but, at the first glance at the building, a feeling of unbearable sadness penetrated my spirit. I say unbearable, because that feeling was not mitigated by that semi-pleasant emotion, because it is poetic, with which it generally welcomes the spirit to the severity of the natural images of desolation or terror. I contemplated the scene before me the simple house, the simple landscape characteristic of the possession, the frozen walls, the windows similar to empty eyes, some reeds lined up and a few white and sickly. It was an icy feeling, a dejection, a nausea in the heart, a irremediable sadness of thought that no stimulus of the imagination could propel us to the sublime. What was that I stopped think about it what was it that discouraged me when I contemplated the house usher? With a complete depression of soul that cannot be properly compared, among terrestrial sensations, rather than with that later dream of the opium addict, with that bitter return to life daily, to the atrocious fall of the veil. It was a completely insoluble mystery couldn't fight the gloomy visions that crowded upon me as I pondered on it. I was forced to resort to the unsatisfactory conclusion that there are, without a simple things that have the power to affect us in this way, although the analysis of that power is based on considerations in which we would lose foot. It was possible, I thought, that a simple difference in the arrangement of the details of the decoration, of the details of the painting, are sufficient to modify, to perhaps annihilate, that capacity for painful impression. Acting on this idea, I let my horse towards the steep bank of a black and gloomy pool that stretched with calm brilliance before the house and I looked down intently but with a deeper shudder terrifying even then before the recomposed and inverted images of the grayish reeds from the livid trunks and from the eye-like windows empty. However, in that gloomy mansion I proposed to reside for a few weeks. Its owner, Roderick Usher, was one of my jovial childhood companions but many years had passed since our last meeting. A letter, however, had reached me recently to a remote part of the region a letter from him whose character of vehement urgency admitted no other response than my presence. The lyrics showed obvious nervous agitation. The author of the letter told me about an acute physical ailment a mental disorder that oppressed him and from an ardent desire to see me, as at his best and in reality his only friend, thinking to find in the joy of my company some relief from his illness. It was the way he said all these things and many more. It was the pleading way of opening his chest to me, which did not allow me hesitation and, therefore, I immediately obeyed, which I considered, despite to everything like a very strange requirement. Although as children we had been close comrades, all things considered, I knew very little about my friend. His reserve was always excessive and habitual. I knew, however, that he belonged to a very ancient family that had distinguished itself since time immemorial by a peculiar sensitivity of displayed through the centuries in many works of high art, and which manifested itself since ancient times in repeated acts of generous although modest charity, as well as a passionate devotion to the difficulties 
perhaps rather than to the orthodox and effortless beauties recognizable from musical science. I also learned of the very notable fact that from the trunk of the lineage of the ushers, however gloriously ancient, had not sprung never, at any time, lasting branch, in other words, that the family entirety had always been perpetuated in a direct line, except very insignificant and in passing exceptions. Such a deficiency, I thought as I reviewed the perfect agreement of those assertions with the race, and while reflecting on the possible influence that one of them could have exercised, in a long series of centuries, on the other it was perhaps that absence of collateral branch and consequent transmission directly, from father to son, of the heritage of the name, what there was, in the long run, identified the two so well, joining the original title of possession to the archaic and misleading name of House of Usher, a name used by the locals, and which seemed to unite in its spirit the family and the manor house. I have already said that the only effect of my experience of so much childishness looking down at the pond was to deepen that first impression. I cannot doubt that my conscience increased superstition why not define it that way, serve to accelerate that growth. Such is, I have known for a long time, the paradoxical law of all feelings based on terror. And that was perhaps the only reason he did, when my eyes from the image of the pond rose towards the house itself, which gushed in my strange vision, a vision so ridiculous, indeed, that if I do mention of it is to demonstrate the living force of the sensations that they oppressed me. My imagination had worked so hard that I really believed that around a peculiar atmosphere hung over the entire house and estate, just as in the most immediate surroundings, an atmosphere that had no affinity with the air from the sky, but emanated from the sickly trees, from the wall's grayish and silent pond, a pestilent and mystical vapor, opaque, heavy, barely discernible, leaden in tone. I shook from my spirit what it couldn't be more than a dream, and I examined it more closely. Real Appearance of the Building Its main characteristic seemed to be that of excessive age. The discoloration caused by the centuries was great. Small mushrooms spread all over the facade, covering it with the fine weave of a fabric from the rooftops. Of course all that is not implied no extraordinary deterioration. None had come off piece of the masonry, and there seemed to be a violent contradiction between that still perfect adaptation of the parts and the special state of the crumbled stones. That reminded me a lot of the spacious integrity of those old carved wood that has been left to rot for long years in some forgotten cave, without contact with the breath of outside air. Apart from this indication of extensive ruin, the building did not show the slightest symptom of instability. Perhaps the gaze of a careful observer would have discovered a barely perceptible crack that, extending from the roof of the facade, made its way zigzagging down the wall, and was going to get lost in the gloomy waters of the pond. Observing these things, I continued on horseback a short embankment towards the house. A waiting footman took my horse, and I entered through the gothic arch of the hall. A furtive servant drove from there, in silence, through many dark and intricate, towards his master's study. Many of the things I found on my path contributed, I don't know why what, to exalt those vague sensations of which I have spoken before. The objects that surrounded me the moldings on the ceilings, the shadowy tapestries on the walls, the ebony blackness of the floors and the ghostly trophies of weapons that jingling with my strides, 
They were things very familiar to me, to which I was accustomed since my childhood, and although I did not hesitate to recognize them all like family, I was surprised by how unusual the visions were that those ordinary images awakened in me. On one of the stairs I met the family doctor. His countenance, I thought, showed a mixture of low cunning and perplexity. He greeted me with embarrassment, and it passed. The servant then opened a door and led me inside the presence of his lord. The room in which I found myself was very spacious and high, the windows, long, narrow and pointed, they were so far from the black floor of oak, which were by no means inaccessible from within. Faint rays of red light made their way through the glass lattices, making sufficiently clear the main objects of. Around, the gaze, however, struggled in vain to reach the corners distant from the room, or the recesses of the vaulted ceiling and with coffers. Dark tapestries hung from the walls. The general furniture was excessive, uncomfortable, old, and lackluster. Numerous books and instruments of music lay scattered around, but they were not enough to give vitality some to the scene. I felt like I was breathing a painful atmosphere. A air of severe, deep and irremissible melancholy hovered and penetrated him all. At my entrance, Usher got up from a sofa on which he was completely stretched out, and greeted me with a warm vivacity that was very similar, perhaps it was my first thought, to an exaggerated cordiality, to the obligatory effort of a man of the world omnia. With everything, the glance I cast in his face convinced me of his perfect sincerity. We sat down, and for a few moments, while he was silent, I looked at him with a feeling half of pity and half of dread. Surely, no man had ever changed in such a terrible way and in as short a time as Roderick Usher. I could hardly myself persuade me to admit the identity of the one who was in front of me, with the companion of my early years. Even so, the character of his physiognomy had always been remarkable. A cadaverous complexion, large, liquid and luminous eyes above all comparison, somewhat thin and very pale lips, but with a curve incomparably beautiful, a nose of a delicate Hebrew type, but of an unusual width in such a shape, a molded chin with finesse, in which the lack of prominence revealed a lack of energy, the hair, which because of its soft tenuity looked like a spider's web, these traits, together with an excessive frontal development, together they made up a physiognomy that was not easy to forget. And at present, in the simple exaggeration of the predominant character of those features, and in the expression they showed, a change was noticeable such that I doubted the man to whom I was speaking. The spectral pallor of the skin and the now miraculous shine of the eyes overwhelmed me above all pondering, and they even terrified me. Furthermore, he had let his silky hair grow without worry, and as that spider tissue floated rather than fell around the face, it did not I couldn't, not even making an effort, relate to that arabesque expression with any idea of simple humanity. At first, I was struck by a certain incoherence, a contradiction in manners. From my friend, and I soon discovered that it came from a series of small and futile efforts to overcome a habitual embarrassment, a excessive nervous agitation. I was already prepared for something of that kind, not only because of his letter, but by the memories of certain features of his childhood, and by the conclusions deduced from their peculiar physical makeup and temperament. Their acts were both lively and indolent, 
His voice varied rapidly from tremulous indecision, when his ardor seemed to fall into complete inaction, to that kind of energetic concision, to that abrupt, heavy, slow enunciation a hollow enunciation to that guttural, leaden speech, very well modulated and balanced, which can observed in the lost drunk or the incorrigible opium eater, during periods of his most intense excitement. So, he spoke of object of my visit, of his ardent desire to see me, and of the joy that expected of me. He went on for quite some time about what he thought about of the nature of his illness. It was, he said, a constitutional, family evil, for which he despaired of finding a remedy, a simple condition nervously, she added immediately, which, without a doubt, would disappear soon. It manifested itself in a multitude of extra-natural sensations. Some, as he detailed them to me, they interested and confused me, although perhaps the terms and gestures of his story had a lot of influence on it. He suffered much of a morbid acuity of the senses. I only tolerated more tasteless foods. I could wear only clothes of a certain fabric. The aromas of all the flowers suffocated him. A light, even weak, tormented his eyes. And only some peculiar sounds, those of string instruments, did not inspire him with horror. I saw that I was the forced slave of some kind of anomalous terror. I will die, he said. I must die of this lamentable madness. Thus, and not of otherwise, I must die. I fear future events, not themselves, but in their consequences. I tremble at the thought of anything from the most trivial incident that can act on this intolerable agitation of my soul. I have a real aversion to danger, except in its absolute effect, terror. In such a state of excitement, in such a state regrettable, I have a feeling that sooner or later there will come a time when life and reason must abandon me at the same time, in some struggle with the horrendous ghost, with fear. I also learn at intervals, for interrupted and ambiguous insinuations, another peculiarity of his state mental. He was chained by certain superstitious impressions, relative to the mansion where he lived, from which he had not dared to leave since many years ago, relating to an influence whose supposed strength expressed in terms too dark to be repeated here a influence that some particularities in the simple form and matter of its manor house had, at the cost of long suffering, he said, achieved on his spirit an effect that the physicality of the gray walls and towers, and from the dark pool in which everything was reflected, he had in the end created on the morality of its existence. He admitted, however, although hesitantly, that much of the special sadness that afflicted him could be attributed to a more natural and much more palpable, to the cruel and already ancient illness, to death without close doubt of a tenderly loved sister, his only companion for long years, her last and only relative on earth. His death dash, he said with a bitterness that I will never be able to forget, I will leave, me, the hopeless, the weak, the last of the ancient race of the ushers. As he spoke, Lady Madeline, that was her name, passed by the most distant part of the room, and without noticing my presence, he disappeared. I looked at her with enormous astonishment not devoid of terror, and, however, it seemed impossible for me to realize such feelings. A feeling of stupor oppressed me as my eyes followed his footsteps receding. When at last the door closed behind her, Maya's gaze instinctively sought his brother's face, 
but he had buried his face in his hands. And I could only observe that a pallor larger than usual had spread over the skinless fingers, through which abundant passionate tears dripped. Lady Madeline's illness had long baffled the sciences of their doctors. A constant apathy, a gradual exhaustion of his person, and frequent, although temporary, attacks of character partial cataleptic, were the singular diagnosis. Until then, she had steadfastly borne the burden of her illness, without finally resigning himself to staying in bed, but, as the afternoon of my arrival fell to the house, she succumbed, as her brother told me at night with an inexpressible agitation, to the prostrating power of evil, and I knew of the look that I had addressed to her, it would probably be the last one that he would never see again. More to that lady, at least alive. For several consecutive days her name was not mentioned by either Usher or for me, and during that period I made earnest efforts to alleviate the melancholy of my friend. We painted and read together, or else I listened, like a dream, to his fiery improvisations on his eloquent guitar. And so, as an ever closer intimacy admitted me with greater frankness into the recesses of his soul, I perceived more bitterly the uselessness of every effort to cheer up a spirit whose blackness, as a quality positive that was inherent to it, poured out on all the objects of the moral or physical universe an incessant irradiation of sadness. I will keep always the memory of many solemn hours that I spent alone with the owner of the House of Usher. Despite everything, I would try in vain to express the exact character of the studies or the occupations, in which I was complicated or whose path showed. A fiery, elevated, sickly ideality shed its light sulfur everywhere. His long funeral improvisations will always resonate in my ears. Among other things, I painfully remember a certain singular perversion, amplified, from the impetuous aria of Weber's last waltz. As for the paintings that incubated his laborious fantasy that arrived, stroke by stroke, to a vagueness that made me shudder even more shock, because he was trembling without knowing why. As for that paintings, of images so vivid that I still have them before me, in vain I would try to extract from them the smallest part that could be contained within the realm of simple written words. For the complete simplicity, due to the nakedness of his drawings, immobilized and overwhelmed the attention. If ever a mortal painted an idea, that mortal was Roderick Usher. For me, at least, in the circumstances that surrounded me, of the pure abstractions that the hypochondriac managed to throw at his canvas, there arose an intense, intolerable terror, whose shadow I have not felt never in the contemplation of dreams, undoubtedly brilliant, although too specific, by Fusilli. One of my friend's ghostly conceptions, in which the spirit of abstraction did not participate so rigidly, it can be sketched, although barely, with words. It was a little painting that represented the interior of an intensely long and rectangular cave or tunnel, with low walls, smooth, white and without interruption or ornament. Certain accessory details of the drawing served to explain the idea that excavation 11 it was too deep below the surface of the earth. I don't know no exit could be seen along its vast expanse nor could any torch or other artificial light source, and yet a surge of rays. Intense waves rolled from side to side, bathing everything in a livid and inadequate splendor.
I have just spoken of that morbid state of the auditory nerve that made all music intolerable to the patient, except certain effects of the string instruments. They were, perhaps, the narrow limits within which he had confined himself, same when playing the guitar those who had largely given that fantastic character to his interpretations. But as for the fervid ease of his impromptus, one could not realize it like that. They had to be, and were, in the notes the same as in the words of his fiery fantasies, for he often accompanied them with rhymed verbal improvisations, the result of that intense recollection, of that mental concentration to which I have alluded before, and which are observed only in special moments of the highest artificial excitement. I remember well the words of one of those rhapsodies. I was impressed perhaps more strongly when he gave it to me, because under his sense inner or mystical I seemed to perceive for the first time that Usher had fully aware of his state. That he felt how his sublime reason was he staggered on his throne. Those verses, titled The Palace Bewitched, were, more or less, if not verbatim, the following. 1. In the greenest of our valleys. Inhabited by good angels. Once a beautiful and majestic palace. A radiant palace raised its forehead. In the domain of King Pansy, there it rose. Never a seraph spread his wing. On a building half as beautiful. 2. Yellow, glorious golden flags. On its top they floated and waved. This, all this, happened a long time ago. A long time. And to every soft breeze that frolicked. In those pleasant days. Along the pale and plumed walls. A winged aroma rose. 3. Those who wandered through that happy valley. Through two illuminated windows, they saw. Spirits moving musically. To the sounds of a well-tempered lute. Around a throne where, sitting. Porphyrogenito. With a splendor worthy of his glory. The Lord of the Kingdom appeared. 4. And shining with pearls and rubies. It was the door of the beautiful palace. Through which it came out in waves, in waves, in waves. And sparkled incessantly. A mob of echoes whose pleasant mission. It was just singing. With voices of magnificent beauty the talent and knowledge of his king. 5. But evil beings, in mourning clothes, they assaulted the monarch's high position. Ah, let's cry, because the dawn never will rise upon him, the desolate one, and around his mansion, the glory that reddened and bloomed. It's just a darkly remembered story of old buried ages. 6. And now the travelers, in that valley, through the reddish windows, come. Vast shapes moving fantastically, in a discordant melody, while, like a swift and horrible river, through the pale door, a horrendous mob rushes eternally, laughing, but never smiling again. I remember very well that the suggestions raised by this ballad they fell into a series of thoughts in which a usher's opinion that I mention here, not so much because of its novelty, for other men have thought the same, but because of the tenacity with which he supported her. This opinion, in its general form, 
was that of the sensibility of all the plant beings. But in his deranged imagination the idea had assumed an even more daring character, and invaded, under certain conditions, the inorganic kingdom. I lack words to express the full extent or serious abandonment of his conviction. This belief, however, was related, as before I have suggested, with the grey stones of his ancestor's mansion. Here the conditions of sensitivity were met, according to him I imagined, by the method of placing those stones, by their arrangement, as well as the numerous fungi that covered them and the sickly trees that stood around, but mostly by the immutability of that provision and for its unfolding in the still waters of the pond. The proof of that sensitivity was, he said, and I heard him speak, startled, in the gradual, but evident condensation, above the waters and around the walls, of an atmosphere that was their own. The result was discovered, he added, in that silent influence, although importunate and terrible, which for centuries had shaped the destinies of his family, and what it did to him as I saw him now, as he was. Such opinions do not need comments, and I will not make them. Our books, the books that for years had been a part of small part of the spiritual existence of the sick person, were, as supposed, in strict accordance with that ghostly character. We carefully studied works such as Vert Vert et Chartreuse, by Gresset, the Belphegor, by Machiavelli, Heaven and Hell, Swedenborg, The Underground Journey, by Nicholas Klim de Hallberg, the Palmistry, by Roberto Flaud, Jean Diendagen and De La Chamber, The Journey Through Blue Space, by Teak, and The City of the Sun, by Campanella. One of his favorite volumes was a small eighth edition of the Directorium Inquisitorium, by the Dominican Imeric de Geron, and there was passages, in Pomponius Mela, about the ancient African satyrs or Egyptians, about which Usher dreamed for hours on end. His main delight, however, was found in the attentive reading of a rare and curious in Cordo Gothic book, the Manual of a Forgotten Church, the Vigilii Mortuorum Secundum Chorum Ecclesi Magantini. I thought to my regret in the strange ritual of that book, and in its probable influence about the hypochondriac, when, one night, having informed me abruptly that Lady Madeline no longer existed, he announced his intention to preserve the body for a fortnight, before burial final, in one of the numerous crypts located under the thick walls of the building. The profane reason he gave about that singular way of the course of action was one that I did not feel free to discuss. As brother, had adopted that resolution, he told me, in consideration to the unusual nature of the deceased's illness, to a certain curiosity importunate and indiscreet on the part of men of science, and to the remote and exposed situation of the family pantheon. I confess that, when I remembered the sinister countenance of the man with whom had found me on the stairs the day I arrived home, I didn't feel desire to oppose what I considered at most as an innocent, but very natural precaution. At Usher's request, I helped him personally in the preparations for that temporary burial. We put the body in the coffin, and between the two of us we transported it to its resting place. The crypt in which we left him, and which had been closed so long ago, that our torches, half finished in that suffocating atmosphere, did not fifteen allowed us no investigation, was small damp and did not allow penetrate light. It was located at a great depth, just below that part of the house where my bedroom was located. Had been used, 
apparently, in distant feudal times, as a dungeon, and in later days, as a deposit of gunpowder or some other material flammable. Since part of the floor and the entire interior of a long vault that we crossed to get there were carefully covered in copper. The door, made of solid iron, was also protected in the same way mode. When that immense weight rotated on its hinges it produced a noise singular, sharp and screeching. We deposit our gloomy burden on some supports in that region of horror, we moved the lid of the coffin, which was not yet screwed, and we looked at the corpse's face. A striking resemblance between brother and sister immediately attracted my attention, and Usher, perhaps guessing my thoughts, murmured something words, by which I learned that the deceased and he were twins, and that there had always existed between them sympathies of an almost inexplicable. Our gazes, meanwhile, did not remain fixed for a long time over the dead woman, since we could not contemplate her without terror. The evil that had brought Lady Madeline to the grave in the plenitude of his youth had left, as often happens in diseases of a strictly cataleptic nature, the mockery of a weak coloring on the breast and face, and on the lips, that equivocal and defaulter that is so terrible in death. We replaced and screwed the lid, and after having secured the iron door, we undertook again our way towards the upper rooms of the house, which they were no less sad. And then, after a lapse of several days of bitter sorrow, he had there was a visible change in the symptoms of my mental illness friend. His ordinary ways disappeared. Your occupations. Ordinary were neglected or forgotten. He wandered from room to room with a hasty, uneven and object. The pallor of his physiognomy had acquired, if possible, a more livid, but the luminosity of his eyes had disappeared complete. I no longer heard that harsh tone of voice that I had before occasions, and a tremor that would have been said to be caused by extreme terror usually characterized his speech. It sometimes occurred to me, in fact, to think that his mind, restlessly agitated, was tortured by some oppressive secret, the disclosure of which had no purpose value to effect. Other times I was forced to think, in short, that these were inexplicable rarities of dementia, since I saw him staring into space for long hours in an attitude of deep attention, as if hearing an imaginary noise. It is not surprising that its state it terrified me, that I would even suffer from its contagion. I felt it slip inside from me, in a slow but sure gradation, the violent influence of his fantastic, yet impressive superstitions. It was especially a night, the seventh or eighth since we deposited Lady Madeline in the dungeon, before retiring to our beds, when I experienced all the power of such sensations. The dream did not want to come close to me bed, while the hours passed and passed. I tried to find a reason nervousness that dominated me. I endeavored to persuade myself that what fell was due, in part at least, to the disruptive influence of the oppressive furniture of the room, to the gloomy torn tapestries that, tormented by the gusts of a storm that was beginning, they wavered from side to side on the walls and creaked painfully in around the decorations of the bed but my efforts were useless. An irrepressible tremor gradually invaded my spirit, and in the long run a true nightmare came to completely take over my heart. I breathed violently, made an effort, managed to shake her off, and sitting up on the pillows and fixing a burning gaze on the dense darkness of the room, I listened. I couldn't say why I prompted an instinctive force, 
to certain vague noises, muffled and indefinite sounds that reached me through the pauses of the storm. Dominated by an intense feeling of horror, inexplicable and unbearable I dressed quickly, since I felt that I would not be able to sleep at all the night, and I tried, walking with large steps through the room, to get out of the lamentable state in which he was immersed. He had barely made a few turns when a light step along a nearby staircase caught my attention by Usher. A moment later he knocked softly on my door and entered, carrying a lamp. His face was, as usual, pale cadaverous. But there was also a kind of madness in his eyes hilarity, and in all its bearing, and evidently contained hysteria. His appearance terrified me, but everything was preferable to the loneliness that I had endured for so long and I welcomed his presence as a relief. And you haven't seen this, he said abruptly, after remained silent for a few moments looking at me. Have not seen you this? Well, wait. You will see it. While speaking thus, and having carefully guarding his lamp, he rushed towards one of the windows and opened them wide to the storm. The impetuous fury of gust lifted us almost off the ground. It was, indeed, a stormy night, but frighteningly beautiful, of singular rarity in its terror and in its beauty. A whirlpool had concentrated its force in our proximity, because there were frequent and violent changes in the direction of the wind, and the excessive density of the clouds, so low that they passed over the tordillas of the house, did not prevent us from appreciating the lively speed with which they came against each other from all points, instead of getting lost at a distance. I say that its excessive density did not prevent us from perceiving that, and even so, we could not see the moon or the stars, nor did any lightning project its radiance but the lower surfaces of those vast masses of agitated vapor, the same as all terrestrial objects very close around us, reflected the supernatural clarity of an emanation soda that hovered over the house and wrapped it in a shroud bright and well visible. You must not, you will not contemplate this, I said, trembling, to usher, and I took him with gentle violence from the window to a chair. Those apparitions that upset him are simple electrical phenomena, nothing rare, or perhaps they have their horrible origin in the fetid miasmas of the pond. Let's close this window, the air is freezing and dangerous for your organism. Here you have one of your favorite novels. I will read and you will hear, and so we will spend this terrible night, together. The old volume the one I had picked up was Sir Lancelot Canning's Mad Tryst, but it had called Usher's favorite book out of sad jest, for, in truth, with its crude and poor prolixity, it could offer little attraction for the elevated and spiritual ideality of my friend. It was, however, the only book which I had immediately at hand, and I gave myself up to the vague hope of that the excitement that agitated the hypochondriac could find relief, for the history of mental disorders is full of similar anomalies, even in the exaggeration of the crazy things that I was going to read to him. Judging by the gesture of predominant and ardent interest with which he listened or pretended listening to the sentences of the narration, I could have congratulated myself on the success of my purpose. I had arrived at that well-known part of history in which Ethelred, the hero of the tryst, having attempted in vain to penetrate peacefully in the hermit's dwelling, he decides to enter by force. Here, as you will remember, the narration says the following. And Ethelred, 
who was by nature of a brave heart, and who now he also felt very strong, thanks to the power of the wine he had drunk, he did not wait any longer to speak to the hermit who had you will see the spirit prone to obstinacy and malice. But, feeling the rain on their shoulders and fearing the unleashing of the storm, he raised his mace, and with a few blows he soon opened a path, through the boards of the door, to his iron-gloved hand. And then pulling it vigorously towards him, he made it creak, sink and break everything into pieces, in such a way that the noise of the dry wood and sounding hollow reverberated from one part of the jungle to another. At the end of this sentence I shuddered and paused, because I had similar, although I immediately thought that my excited imagination was deceiving, that from a very remote part of the mansion he arrived confusedly at my ears a noise that would have been said. Because of its exact resemblance of tone, the echo, but muffled and deaf, certainly of that real noise of creaking and tearing described in such detail by Sir Lancelot, was without a doubt the only coincidence that had attracted only my attention because between the tapping of the window sashes and the mixed noises of the gathering tempest, the sound itself had, surely, nothing that might intrigue or disturb me. I continued the narration. But the good champion Ethelred, passing through the door, he felt painfully angry and astonished when he perceived no trace of the malicious hermit, but, instead, a dragon of phenomenal and scaly, with a tongue of fire, and it was of sentinel before a palace of gold, with a floor of silver, and on the wall a shiny bronze shield appeared hanging, with this legend above it. Whoever enters here will be the winner, whoever kills the dragon, the shield will win. Ethelred raised his mace and struck on the dragon's head and he fell before him and exhaled his pestilent breath with a noise so horrendous, harsh and penetrating at the same time, that Ethelred had to cover his ears with his hands to resist that terrible roar like he had not heard never before. Here I suddenly made a new pause, and now with a feeling of violent astonishment, since there was no doubt that I had heard this time, it was impossible for me to say which direction it came from. A faint noise and as if distant, but harsh, prolonged, singularly sharp and grating, the exact counterpart of the supernatural dragon rite described by the novelist and just as my imagination had already imagined. Oppressed as he was, without a doubt, by that second and very extraordinary coincidence, due to a thousand contradictory sensations, between the which predominated an extreme astonishment and terror, I kept, however, sufficient presence of mind to be careful not to excite with a, any observation of my companion's nervous sensitivity. No, I was not at all sure that he would have noticed the noises in question, even, no doubt, a strange alteration had manifested itself, since a few minutes ago, in his attitude. From your first position in front of me had he gradually turned his chair so that he was sitting with his face turned towards the door of the room, so, only I could see part of his features, although I noticed that his lips trembled as if they let out an inaudible murmur. His head was drooping on his chest and yet I knew he was and was asleep, because the eye that he glimpsed in profile remained open and permanent. Furthermore, the movement of his body also contradicted that idea, since it swung with a gentle, but constant and uniform oscillation. I noticed all this, of course, and resumed Sir Lancelot's story, which it continued like this. And now the champion, having escaped the terrible fury of the dragon, and remembering the bronze shield, 
and at the enchantment that over it weight was broken, he pushed the dead mass out of his way and he advanced bravely across the silver floor of the castle towards the side of the wall where the shield hung, who, in truth, did not wait for was very close, but fell at his feet on the pavement of silver, with a heavy and terrible noise. These last syllables had barely passed my lips, and as if in an reality a bronze shield would have fallen at that moment heavy on a silver floor, I heard the echo clear, deep, metallic, twenty resonant, if dull in appearance. Excited beyond measure, I jumped on my feet, while Usher had not stopped his rocking rhythmic. His eyes were fixed before him and his entire physiognomy, contracted by a stony rigidity. But when I put my hand on his shoulder, a loud shudder ran through his entire being, a weak smile trembled over his eyes, lips, and I saw that he spoke in a dull, rapid, stammering murmur, as if he didn't notice my presence. Leaning over him, I finally absorbed the horrendous meaning of his words. Don't you hear? Yes, I hear, and I have heard. For a long, long time, many minutes, many hours, many days, I have heard, but not me dared oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I did not dare. I didn't dare speak. We put her alive in the tomb. Have I not said that my senses are heightened? I tell you now that I have heard your first weak movements inside the coffin. I have heard them many years ago, many days, and yet I did not dare to speak. And now, tonight, Ethel read, ha ha ha. The hermit's door broken, the death cry of the dragon and the roar of the shield. You better say the tearing of your coffin, and the creaking of the iron hinges of his prison, and his struggle within from the copper vault. Oh! Where to flee? Won't she be here followed? Aren't you going to appear to reproach me for my haste? Haven't I heard a step on the stairs? Do I not perceive the heavy and horrible pulsation of your heart? Fool, and at that moment he rose furiously from his tiptoe and howled his syllables as if in that effort he exhaled his soul, foolish. I tell you that she is now behind the door. At the same instant, as if the superhuman energy of his words would have acquired the power of a spell, the great and ancient leaves that he pointed to slowly opened their heavy ebony jaws. It was the work of a furious gust, but in the frame of that door there was then the tall, shrouded figure of Lady Madeline de Usher. There was blood on his white clothing, and his entire emaciated person showed the obvious signs of a bitter struggle. During a moment she remained trembling and hesitating on the threshold, then, with a with a muffled, plaintive cry, he fell forward on his back. Brother, and in his violent and now final agony he dragged him to the ground, already corpse and victim of his anticipated terrors. I fled from that room and that mansion, horrified. The tempest it was still unleashed in all its fury when I crossed the old road. Suddenly an intense light was projected onto the road, and I turned to see where such singular clarity could emerge, since I only had the vast mansion and its shadows. The irradiation came from the full moon, which was setting between a red of blood, and which now shone brightly through that crack before barely visible, and which, as I said at the beginning, extended, zigzagging, from the roof of the building to the base. While the as I examined, that crack widened rapidly, there was again impetuous gust, a whirlpool, 
the entire disk of the satellite exploded suddenly before my sight. My brain was upset when I saw the heavy walls collapse, split in two, a long and tumultuous roar resounded, like the voice of a thousand waterfalls, and the deep and fetid pool, located at my feet, closed gloomily and silently on the remains of the House of Usher.